A Pharisee named Simon was having a dinner party, and he invited Jesus. We talk about Pharisees, Sadducees, both of them, and often we don't know what, what those were. They were actually kind of like religious groups, religious parties in the time of our Lord, and they were the two most prominent. There may have been others, uh, but we find them throughout the New Testament story, the Pharisee and the Sadducees. The big difference between the two is that the Pharisees believed you got into God's good side by following the works of the law, and the Sadducees believed that you did it through the ritual observances in the temple. And if you didn't do the ritual observances, no matter how much you kept the law, you still get it, didn't get into God's good graces. And also the Pharisees believed in eternal life and the resurrection. And the Sadducees did not believe in eternal life and the resurrection. Most people don't know this, but throughout the Old Testament period, there was no belief in eternal life as we think of it today. You died and you were gathered with your with those who had passed before you. You were gathered into some place called Sheol, which was a kind of a half-life. There was no real continuation of life. And during the intertestamental period of about 400 years from the last book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament, something not filled in in our Bible. There are books that were written during that period. They were rejected by the Protestant church. You'll find them in the Catholic Bible. I was looking for, through our Bible up there on the pulpit, which was on the lectern, which was made to be used by all churches, and I came across a, a, a Bible book in the Old Testament called Diana. <laughs> what? I've never seen that before. It's part of what we call the Apocrypha, used by Catholics and not used by Protestants. Some, some of the material is quite, quite wonderful, but we don't include it in ours. But it was during that period that, they, that the uh, Pharisees came to believe in eternal life and the resurrection, which they believed in when our Lord came. They just didn't believe in him. And they didn't, after his crucifixion and death, they didn't believe in his resurrection. But Jesus, actually, because he believed in eternal life and taught eternal life, and uh, he, he would have been numbered among the Pharisees. And the, a Pharisee, Simon, invited him uh, to dinner. Now, there's been a lot of controversy about the, uh, the Last Supper at the, uh, at the Olympics, at the, at the uh, people who gathered on the stage there, set up like Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Uh, kind, of a, kind of a tempest in a teapot, because what they're really upset about is uh, the fact that all of the people up there were gay people. If it had been uh, some uh, hunky Hollywood actor in the place of Jesus, uh, Charlton Heston in his best, you know, nobody would have objected to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, although uh, Charlton Heston is not one of my favorite people. He was a big proponent of the NRA uh, and having no gun laws at all. And, uh, but, but he could have stood in for Jesus and nobody would object. The real objection, uh, and I, I, I may be swinging you on this, or you may not even want to go with me, you may object to what I'm saying, is that those people were, uh, were thought to be blaspheming uh, partly because they were all gay people. And uh, were they trying to sock it to the church a little bit? Yes, they were. But if I were in France and the only church was the Catholic Church, which does not, would not admit uh, their, their, their full humanity, uh, call them sinners, you might want to sock it to the church a little bit. I don't, I, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. It's neither here nor there. But I, I really wasn't uh, upset about it myself. But you know, at the Last Supper, <laughs> Leonardo has everybody lined up on one side of the table like they're going to have their picture taken. You do realize that, don't you? Nobody eats like that. 
<laughs> I mean, there's no reason for anybody all to line up on one side of the table, except we need to see the faces of all of them. It's really quite a glorious painting. But that's not the way they would have eaten in our Lord's day. They would have been eating probably in, in the uh, Roman style, which meant that they would have been lying on pallets or on short couches facing inward and the meal in the middle, and they would have been lined all the way around it, and they would have been lying down with their feet sticking out. And this is the way we are to picture our Lord at Simon's uh, feast that he is having, his dinner. And uh, <laughs> it may have even been a Roman home where there was a kind of an atrium in the middle and they may have been dining out there under the sky or they could have been in, in a fancy dining hall. We don't know. But anyway, when people had a special guest in their home, other people were sometimes wandered in. If there was a teacher who was there, they would wander into the house. They wouldn't get to come to the table, but they would get to hear the great person speak. And so there were people who were probably lined around the wall uh, watching the meal, watching Simon and his guests and our Lord there. And it appears that our Lord was probably across on the other side of the food from Simon, the Pharisee, who was the host. And while they were eating, there was a, <laughs> there was a woman who wandered in. Now, I don't, I don't know what the present translation says, but I know the old King James. It says she was a woman of the city. Okay, uh, we know what her profession was. They say it's the oldest in the world. And she has wandered in, and uh, when she comes in and sees Jesus, she, she begins to cry. Those of you who have been touched by his grace in your life, you can understand that. And then she does something, though, that's quite remarkable. <laughs> she doesn't stand along the wall and cry. She's operating totally on, on impulse. She, she makes her way over to him and kneels at his feet. Now, this is a woman who has heard a word from Jesus, a woman who formerly had believed that there was no way for her to be included among the righteous again. No entrance for her into heaven. A woman who may be on the streets because she had no way of making a living. Perhaps her husband put her out and wrote a bill of divorcement and said, you're on your own. We don't know how she ended up out there. But she saw no way back into society back into God's care for her. And she has heard him tell her that her sins are forgiven already, washed away, clean. She's already heard him tell her that she is loved that God loves us all, even those who don't love God. Remember, love your enemies, love those that don't love you. And this has obviously changed her life to the extent that now, just in seeing him there, she cannot control herself her response, her love. So she rushes over t t to him. I mean, I laugh when I think about the scene because it's, it is so disturbing. It, imagine it happening at your house if you had a dinner party. Uh, rushes over to him and kneels at his feet and she is crying so hard that, that the tears are falling down on his feet. She, she evidently felt that she was not worthy still for, for her tears 
to be on his feet. So she does something absolutely unheard of for a woman in public. She takes her hair down and, and see it falling all the way down. You remember the old saying about, boy, she really let her hair down? Even during the time of Shakespeare, women did not let their hair down in public. It was always up. Only for their husbands in private would they let their hair down. Well, she let her hair down, and you can see it falling all around her face. And she takes her long hair, which may not have been cut in years, and she wipes her tears off of his feet with her hair. Now, nobody says anything. Well, first of all, when people are in shock, they tend not to speak. And everybody's in shock except Jesus. Simon over there, he says nothing. But the scripture tells us what he thinks. If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what kind of woman is touching him. And Jesus knows what Simon is thinking. Now, the problem with Simon and the conclusion that he has come to is that he thinks that this woman is in some other category from himself. He is righteous. She is a sinner. And he also feels that there's not really anything that can change that. He is loved by God. She is not. And th this fills his mind. He never considers even for a moment that he is anything like this woman or that she is anything like himself, not for a moment. What he doesn't know is that for all of us, for all of us, there is only one category, and that is child of God, beloved child of God. Every person in this world, beloved child of God. And Jesus speaks to Simon and says, uh, <laughs> Simon, look at this woman. I came into your house. You, you didn't wash my feet, as is the custom when a guest comes into your home. You didn't anoint my head with oil, as is the custom. But this woman has anointed my feet with her tears and dried them with the hairs of her head. Because she has been forgiven much, she loves much. Because you feel that there's not much to forgive, you have loved little. My sister's teaching this class down there, and many of you are in it. We have a room full every Sunday, and it's about near-death experiences. What you find in near-death experiences is that everything that our Lord told us is, is real. This love that he told us about from God, this unconditional love, this is real. I heard one the other day about a young man uh, it's a young black man who was quite charming and ingratiating. You wonder why he ever had the problems that he had, but the first thing that happened to him was after he was born, his mama took him living and threw him in a dumpster. He was found, retrieved, 
I think his grandmother raised him, but he had a hard life. And he finally decided he had taken enough. He was in his early 20s or mid-20s by that time. And he had decided he was going to end it all. He was going to go down to the railroad tracks and at the station and wait for the train to be coming, and he was going to throw himself on the tracks. But his friends realized that this time he was really going to do something when he left their company, and so they followed him. And just before he threw himself in front of the train, they pulled him back. And one of the young women put him in the car with her, and started driving him back home. Amazingly, he did finally hear from his father, whom he had tried to contact, knew who it was. And the call came at that time of all times. And his father told him, I don't love you. I don't want anything to do with you. And the boy thought, I cannot take this anymore. He was distraught. He opened the door of the car and he threw himself out on the pavement. And he was so severely injured that he found himself in some other place. He died for a while. And there was God. And he said, who are you? And God said, an obvious answer, I am God. Yes, I'm real. And so are angels. Do you want to see them? He said, no. And God said, I'm here to tell you that I love you. That's something God is willing to tell us in our hardest moments. I love you. I look at so many experiences where God communicates in one way or another and sometimes just plain outright, I love you. I cherish you. You are mine. And he showed him three images. Unfortunately, I only remember one. He showed him an image of a woman somewhere on a street, and he knew that she was a prostitute. He showed him two other similar images of people who were outside, who were left behind considered worthless as he was when mama threw him into the trash bin. And he said, now you go back and you tell them that I love them. And he did come back. And he spends a lot of time telling his story to anyone who will hear it. Because his mission in the world now is to tell everyone that God loves them. Because we're all in the same category. Children of God. There's only one category for all of us. We hear so much about the people coming across the border. Look at them. On TV, they'll say we're being invaded by hordes. Focus in a little more carefully. This looks like a family. This looks like a mother and a father and their child. This looks like a young man who escaped a gang gang in South America just before the gang killed him. 
This looks like a mother carrying her baby. All of them. One category. Child of God. Look at that image of the Lord's Supper. I know you may have found it offensive. I, don't, I, I can understand that. I don't blame you. But look at that woman in the middle there, sitting in the place of Jesus, wearing some kind of big headdress that looks almost like a halo. A very large woman, a gay woman. Put any terms on her you want to, but there's only one term that counts. Child of God. Look at anybody you may be judging. I tried this. I ate out last night. I was looking at somebody across from me who looked funny. Does she have to wear her hair that way? In public? Wonder who, I wonder who she is. And then I tried, well, I know who she is. She's a child of God. That's who she is. She's the same thing I am. Same thing all of us are. That's why we can all come to this table this morning. All of us. Well, I'm not feeling too spiritual today. I've seen some people sit it out. By the way, some people here, this will be your first communion. You don't have to come come if you want to. But here's the important thing you understand. The table is simply open to everybody. Someone might come in and say, well, I don't really believe in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Do you think that keeps him from loving you? Come and discover his grace. Discover that his body is broken for you. His blood fell for you. Grace precedes belief. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come to his table. It is open to all because all of us are in the same category. We are a child of God. No, I didn't make this sermon up on the spot. I had two that were ready to go, but I'm glad I chose this one because we need to know it just to keep us from sitting around in a restaurant, looking around and judging everybody at the other tables. You may not do that. You may be better than I am. But we need to know it. That's who we are. Join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we pray first of all for those who have lost a loved one, being here with them in that moment, when she heard her father had died, has simply pulled us into that experience. We know you love them, Lord, and you love their father, and we know that he is safe in your presence. Thank you, Lord, that we can be in church together this day and to remember your love and to give thanks for you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.